Hi, everybody. Hope you're doing marvelously well. In this episode, we're going to be interviewing Matt Zoe. Matt Zoe is a British DJ, producer, remixer. He's a solo artist in his own right, getting signed at 17 years old. Now, really at only 30 years old, he's done a wealth of things. He's put out several solo records. He's remixed tons and tons of great stuff. He also owns a label putting out electronic music. This is a really fascinating interview for me because I get to talk to somebody about the creation of music, but also what it's like to choose music for a label, what it's like to try and get noticed in these days. It's a really fascinating conversation. Please join us while we talk to Mr. Matt Zo. So, Matt Zo, how are you? I'm great, thanks. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. We were just talking off camera about how you're born in England, but then moved to America. They went back to England, and now you're back in America. Yeah, I've kind of flip-flopped all over the place. <laughs> It's definitely given me a unique perspective, for sure, especially with music. I mean, growing up in the UK versus here, it's like a whole different yeah. musical universe. Half the people I deal with are working on 10 remixes at once. You know, they're balancing all of these different projects. Because of the convenience of the way we work now, do you find that you're working on so many different projects Number one, and if you are, how do you stay focused? Do you, do you move around quickly between things? I mean, I have a bunch of different projects going right now, and I sort of, yep. you know, skim between them because I want to stay inspired um, when I'm working on a tune. And if I'm really not feeling something, I'll just leave it for a while, let it um, marinate, so to speak. And then when I come back to it later, it'll, it'll still sound fresh. How much are you balance it, balancing out working on your own material as a solo artist with, with working with others? Well, I'm doing a lot more with others now. For a long time, I only worked on my own stuff and maybe did a few collabs here and there. But now I'm working with uh, a very talented artist called Olin, who uh, I've she, she's on a bunch of tracks on my next album. But we have started a band and writing a bunch of material for that. I'm on your Wikipedia page here, which is, it's actually a lot of packed information in a very short space of time, to put, say the least. It's talking about your solo albums that came out in 2013. First of all, how did you get a deal? Because the whole world is so different now, obviously. Did you find that, you know, you put up music independently, then somebody came to you and said, I love what you're doing? Or did you send in independent, your own music into labels? Yeah. How did that come about? I mean, it was a really different time back then. And it wasn't that long ago, like 2007, uh, 2008. Maybe this yeah. is very dance music specific, but you would upload your music to forums and then some DJs would have scouts that would scour these forums for uh, new music and new artists. And one of my tracks got picked up by Tiesto and he asked me to do a remix and then that remix got some attention and got other people interested and it sort of snowballed from there. Whereas I, I feel right. like nowadays that is a lot more rare because it's so oversaturated. There's so many people making music on their computers and it makes getting noticed a lot harder. What would be your advice if you were a young up and coming um, artist? How, how do you think you, can get, you would get noticed these days? Well, you just have to stand out from the rest either in terms of production or sadly marketing wise you know having a good brand so to speak but i would i would always recommend the former <laughs> before anything you know whereas somebody in the music industry might say otherwise that you need a good brand i agree with you i think quality music with branding is not going to going to hurt as long as the music's quality but where do you think mm -hmm. um you know people should post their music how, how can you get discovered, do you think? I mean, sending demos to labels is still the best. I mean, I have a label, and that's how we get all of our demos. It's always worth sending your music to demos. Every label is still listening to demos. How much of a proportion of your day is going through listening to those demos? <laughs> I mean, it depends. Some days I'll like sit down, okay, right, I'm going to go through all of them. What is it that you're listening for? Something completely unique that you've never heard before that just completely sparks your interest? I can't say for others, but for myself, 
for my mm-hmm. label. I'm looking for certain talent that goes beyond a certain genre. You know, I'm I'm looking for talented artists that can make good music in a variety of styles. And usually they'll send one or two tracks, and it's hard for me to judge that. Your mother was a professional, or is a professional violinist. Presumably, music was just nonstop in your house. Yeah, yeah, it was it was enforced <laughs> in my house. I kind of rebelled against it a bit. Now I don't have a choice. I, I couldn't do anything else. I wake up every day and all I want to do is just make music. Was it all uh, classical music that you grew up surrounded by? Mm-hmm. And a little bit of rock from my brothers. They were into grunge and metal and stuff. So there was this music channel that I had access to that would sometimes play dance music. It was a Canadian music channel, Much Music. Um, oh, I know Much Music, still, of course. Yeah, 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 still around today. Back in the day, they would have this uh, club show on Saturdays, and I would get my dance music from that. Which DAW do you use then on a PC? I use Ableton. It's been my dog Amazing. for about 12 years now. For me, it's, it's the speed of it, because you can get ideas down so quickly with it. Even just uh, things that you can do with MIDI information within Ableton, like manipulating MIDI data, automation, randomization, and think like... The problem I have with electronic music most of the time is that it's too clean and linear and there's not enough randomness Absolutely. in it. And I agree with you 100% on the randomness. And this is my own opinion, but I really feel strongly that, you know, back in the early, mid-90s, it seems like, you know, it, seem, it seems like we were doing stuff that's more interesting than what I'm listening to at the moment. You know, when there was a mixture between sampled and organically created sounds with, syn- you know, with, with synthesis and everything, it was really refreshing. Stuff is getting there, but so, so much of it sounds copied and pasted these days. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's hard to replicate those non-linearities, those little artifacts that you get from... I mean, back then, everything was still on tape. And Simpty. Yeah. We were triggering everything by Simpty. We had a, I remember I would take a loop. I had a, I, I, I couldn't afford the S1000. I had the S650. And I remember we would take a, a loop and you would just have to sit there and tr- you couldn't lay it and look at it on a grid. So you just had to go, you have to try and cut it to loop it. And you just did it till it felt good. And, and because you had to use your ears, you would get, little human character characteristics from everything. That's definitely missing from a lot of mu- music nowadays because everything's so perfect. How do you overcome that in our modern world? Using uh, little bits of randomization within the computer. Recently, I've been using more outboard stuff, less linear since, so I could, don't have to do as much in the box. So are you doing performances and then not editing them afterwards, trying to capture, like, analog organic performance yep. as opposed to triggering. Exactly. Right. I get that for like melodic stuff that you're adding, but how about for like the basis of a, like a rhythm track? What kind of ideas would you, do you think you can share with us to kind of help the rhythm track feel a little bit more wrong, right. random, <laughs> human, <laughs> whatever yeah. the word is? Yeah, definitely adding little bits of randomness to the MIDI as well that you can do in Ableton. I'm not sure if you can do that with many other DAWs, maybe Bitwig as well. You can have... a uh, a groove that attaches to all the different MIDI clips, and then you can add add a random function to it, so it plays a little bit ah. off time, and that's that's one way. You know, we talked about this before with like some of the multi tracks that are available. You know, of tracks. I think one of the ones I I can think of pretty powerfully is the Stevie Wonder uh, Superstition. That if you solo any one of the elements, it sounds like a little bit of a chain, train wreck. It's like it doesn't really stand on itself, but as soon as you put them together, it's just magic, absolute magic. And you realize that these are all decisions that are made with one sound affecting another, another performance affecting it, where I think we're so used to like performances being heard in isolation, and we forget that's not how music was made for decades. Exactly. Yeah, it's, music is a feedback process of different musicians playing off each other. And to replicate that in the DAW is really difficult, but it's not impossible. So let's just say you built your, you built your drum track, you're using some randomized function to change timings, velocities, presumably as well. So it's not always like, you know, hitting at the same uh, dynamic range. So, so you've done that. 
what's your next part of your process? Are you going to melody instruments? Are you putting bass lines down? Depends on the track, but right. definitely for getting like randomness into melodic elements, if I'm doing like synths in the box, I'll add little random LFOs to things to give it that analog character. Like even just a normal saw wave pad, even if you add a little bit of wobble to maybe the phase or you know something of one of the oscillators, it just adds that little bit of organic warmth, so to speak. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna start by making a drum beat sound a little bit more human, and we're gonna just use some basic techniques to add a little bit of human quality. So I have this drum beat that I'm playing in Superior Drummer, and it's just a standard sort of John Bonham type drum beat. And right now you can tell it's like really mechanical and quantized. If you go to Grooves, we're just going to add any groove that's in 16th notes. It doesn't really matter because we're not going to use the timing aspect of it or the velocity. We're just going to add a little bit of randomness to the timing of the MIDI. And already it's just sounding a lot more human. it's not exactly perfect. Another thing we can do is add a little bit of random velocity with this velocity device. So now it's more as if a human was playing it rather than it's a quantized drum beat that I've arranged myself. That's a very basic way to add some randomness into your project. You can then export this out as a drum beat or have this in your project and yeah, have your drum sounding a little bit more human. The other thing I want to talk about is doing random sound design. What I'm talking about is generating a bunch of sound and then recording it, and then you have that as audio, which you can then use whenever. But here's a way to make your sound design a little bit more intricate and sounding unique no matter what. Now I'm going to pull up any old synth. It doesn't really matter. We'll just take a simple sine wave. Let's make some bass sounds. So. I'm going to make this mono, a mono synth and have this legato. So, yeah, it doesn't re trigger when I change notes. Maybe add some glide and maybe add some difference to the glide. So, when I hit the keyboard with more velocity or play a note with more velocity, it, the glide is higher. So, So if I press slightly, it's a very quick change. But if I press hard, and that's just a way to add a little bit more variation. We're just going to start with a very simple sound source, maybe add some FM oscillator. And then we'll take a random modulator. And attach that to the FM amount. If uh, I was using a synth that didn't have internal random modulators, I could bring up 
a Max for Live device called LFO. And what this allows you to do is attach a random modulator to whatever you want. So you can go inside your synth if it doesn't have a random modulator. You can attach one of the parameters to this controlling device. But since Faceplant has its own internal random modulators, I'll be using that. OK, so something very simple like that. And what we're going to do is create another instrument. What we're looking to do is basically create as many different sound sources as we want. Let's make an operator as well, solo it. And it really doesn't matter too much. It, as long as there's not too many harmonics in the sound source, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, if you're going for bass sounds, then obviously you want to have them be lower frequency. But it doesn't really matter too much at this stage. It can sound as cheap and digital as you want. Maybe add a shaper. Let's find something to add random modulation to. Maybe add some subtle modulation to the pitch. Oh yeah, and also we want to make it a mono synth as well. You'll see what we'll do with all these different instruments in a second. So let's do one more just to demonstrate. Of course, I could do way more than three, but before I do that, Let's add some random movement to this synth. So make this random. And I guess I'll put it on the level of this oscillator. And also, I'm going to attach the pitch to the velocity. Again, it really doesn't matter what this sounds like, as long as it, there's some movement and some interest in it. Now let's add another synth. For this, I guess I'll use, just to demonstrate that it really doesn't matter, I'll use this piano. And I'm going to filter it a bit so it's just low pass. Maybe put it down an octave as well. We're making bass sounds. So we have that. And maybe let's attach some random movement to this. So all, the, all these sounds are pretty different. Mm. 
now what I'll do is I'll add this device which I made that allows me to trigger a random parameter or a random number to a parameter every time a note hits. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all of these. And this is an instrument rack. And it allows you to separate each chain into a sort of segment which you can automate. I'll so here I've distributed the ranges so they're even. And if this selector is above that chain, that synth plays. If it's above this, it plays that. And if it's above there, it plays the piano. So I'm going to put this, attach this here. So now every time I hit a note, it's going to play a random patch. And this is just our sound source. Now what I'm going to do is, before this random note message, I'm going to add another device which I've made, which just spits out random notes. And I could put these in a scale, but essentially what we're about, about to do is sort of let the computer do the work for us. So random note generator. And what this does is it allows you to just not have to play the keyboard, and it'll do everything for you. You just have to set some parameters here. So now, as long as the transport is running, these will play. And you can make your own Max for Live devices, which is the cool thing about Ableton. And there's obviously a bunch of free devices online that you can get. This one is one that I made, but you can buy it. But there are other free ones that you can download, or as I said, make, make it yourself, because it's not that difficult. OK, so now that we have a random sound source, let's do some random processing to go with it. Let's start with distortions and, pro and processing like that. Or maybe we can start with space and reverbs and delays. How about that? And then do processing after that. We can do it any way we want, but the whole point is that we, we randomize all of these things. So let's add a delay. I'm going to do the same thing that I did with the instruments with the effects. So and maybe some reverb. Some more reverb. You know, messing with long reverb, short reverbs, delays, really doesn't matter. Anything that creates space, choose crystallizer. We could add more, but let's just stick with four just to demonstrate. So now, 
Let's do the same thing here. We'll add another random note message. So now along with every time I hit a random note, every time I hit a note, it'll play a random patch. It'll also uh, trigger a random effect, a random spatial effect. Now let's do some other processing after that. And again, we're going to keep it random. We can minimize these. OK, so let's do distortion. Start with a simple saturator. Actually, we can have one chain that's just dry. Okay, so we're going to do some saturation. Take the output down. Okay, um, let's make another one. Maybe this one will have some bit crushing on it. Index. And why don't we add some random movement to the rate of this bit crusher, since we can. And you'll see, we'll add more and more of these racks as we go. That'll trigger random effects every time we hit a note. What else can we do? Let's add a different type of distortion. Maybe pedal and set it to fuzz. Um, and let's see what else. Maybe something crazy like a frequency shifter. And we'll add another random LFO. Frequency. We can control the range up here. There. So now drag out all these chains, do distribute ranges equally. Now, for this, I want to do something slightly different. I want to have it so they fade into each other. And the cool thing about these random note messages is I can smooth things out and have things gradually uh, fade to, from one value to the next. So what I can do here, I'm going to Add a little bit of overlap. And then you see these little white bars at the top here. You can drag those. And that's basically a crossfade. Now, I'm going to add another random note message. I'm going to smooth it out a little bit. So now it morphs between those effects. And I can keep going. Let's add some phasers, flangers, comb filters, stuff like that. 
Um, we could start with a flange. Add a kilohertz plugin called Snap Heap, which is a great plugin. Come filter. So it's kind of like a flanger. Let's do a phaser next. can add all sorts of crazy effects like a vocoder. Maybe cabinet. I mean, you can pretty much drag random effects in and see what happens. And we'll do the same thing here. Distribute. And I want these to fade into each other as well. Add another one of these. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all these effects and group those. And then after all of them, I'm going to put an EQ. And this is something I do mainly for bass sounds. I take all that processing and I high pass it. Put it in linear phase mode. And then layer the original back with it. And then what I like to do after the EQ, I'll put a compressor. So what that does is it squashes all that processing and harmonics and sound design stuff, and all the dynamics comes from the original patch, or the original sound source. So now, remember we have our random note generator. Thank you. 
And to make it a little bit less random, we'll, we can put a, a scale so it only plays certain notes. So let's make it like a sort of limit it to only a few notes. And sometimes you get a little bit too much um, dynamics. So sometimes you want to maybe put a limiter and basically just push everything into the limiter before the effects. Yep, so now when I play the random notes, So what I usually do is I then open up M Recorder or any other VST that allows you to record audio. And instead of you know trying to sculpt something with MIDI and you know doing it all by hand, I'll just put it in record mode and let all these sounds play. And then I'll have an audio file full of random sounds that I can use in my projects. So really, you can do this with any sound sources, any sort of signal effects. And the cool thing about Ableton is it lets you choose whatever you want to put in an instrument rack or in an effect rack, and just allows you to do everything in groups and racks. And then it allows you to randomize those racks. And especially in the new uh, version of Ableton, Ableton 11, you have snapshots and all other sorts of things and macros to help you out. Yeah, you could extend this out infinitely as as far as your CPU can handle, you know, adding more and more layers of processing. But really the key to it is the variety of different sounds. Uh, morphing through different sounds creates interesting sound design pretty much no matter what the processing is. So this is just a, one way to find little happy accidents. Thank you for watching. I hope this was insightful. I've got to ask you about this. Having already previewed an album set to play with Matt Zoe and friends at Minecraft Party. <laughs> I was wondering <laughs> I just, if you'd mention that. Yeah. I was going to mention it because I have a 13-year-old son. So Minecraft is a game <laughs> that's been, yep. that's I think, the number one game uh, in the world. You could play it like a, a game, like, you know, with achievements and whatnot, or you could just use it as a building tool. We use it as a building tool to build events. So there's a stage, either the artist or sometimes the artist's son <laughs> or daughter oh. <laughs> goes up on stage and um, controls their character and talks to people in game and stuff. And then we play live audio through a plugin through my DAW actually. Uh, wow! Um, streams live audio to everyone. How many people do you get coming to each event? We get hundreds. Uh, we're trying to get thousands for the next one, but uh, the last one we had about 380 people. So you're busy. I mean, you've, you've got a label, you're doing uh, production and remixing and mixing for others. Um, you're putting on these Minecraft events. 
you're working with a new artist. I suppose you're living the dream. You wake up playing, <laughs> making music and you go to sleep making music. Yeah, I mean, I, I should get out of the house more, but other than that, it's pretty much <laughs> living the dream. Yeah. Do you have any of your own stuff coming out soon? Yep. It's all mastered and ready. That'll be out on Anjuna Beats on October 9th, which is a uh, British UK trance label. Looking at your uh, resume here, Porter Robinson, Chuck D, some great mm. collaborations. Yeah, I've been really fortunate. Recently, I had the fortune to have Perry Farrell. Oh, wow. Is it going to be on your new album? I wish. <laughs> no, I didn't even ah. get to meet him, but he he's uh, we collaborated on a song um, that I started. I worked with 311 as well, which has been really cool. I've gotten to do some really cool collabs over the years. It also seems like you got relatively successful quite early on. And I think a lot of people that had uh, maybe five or 10 years of ghosting have, have took a long time to get... I wonder how much of that's a chicken of the egg, you know, where you spend so much time working for somebody else that you're not able to spend as much time on your own material. Um, so that, that could be a, a composite of it. But it seems like, you know, what was your first releases? You were saying like 2007, 2008, when you were first bro breaking in, you would have only been 17 or 18 years old. Yeah, at the time, I was one of the youngest people in the dance music scene nowadays every every dj is 18 19 so it's a completely right. different world um but yeah being young back then definitely helped because dance music in the uk um has been huge since the mid late 80s a lot of the biggest guys are my age and older yeah it's like the edm explosion already happened in the uk when i was there um in right. like the mid Naughties, I'd say. Out of the box production for me is very new. I've only been buying up pieces of gear for the last three years. What kind of external priest do you have? Uh, right now I have a, a 737 Avalon. I just bought a bunch of Cappy stuff. If you want value for money, I don't think you'll get better than that. Actually, I've got an art night base based on one of your videos. Talk about Perry Farrell. That's the sound of Jane's Addiction. Right. That's, um, yeah, Dave Jordan. Yep. Yeah, it's funny because after that, I did that video, I was looking online. All the night bass went up like three times the price because yeah. there's not that many out there. So they went from like $150 to suddenly I was seeing them at like four or 500 And I'm like, what happened? Yeah, it was sitting in um, Future Music. I was like, I recognize that. I'm getting that. <laughs> That's so really, thank, really cool. Thanks for I that. I mean, it's like <laughs> so wrong. It's right. And mine, mine has like a flickering screen and like <laughs> it, it's kind of a little <laughs> bit broken. I had to put a new uh, knob on it for the program control. But yeah, it's, it sounds great. Like I use it on every, yeah, every time. Eric I, Avery, it's uh, Jane's Addiction kind of bass tone. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, mixed in with Alice in Chains. Yeah, well, Alice in Chains is the reason I got it because I'm a huge Alice right. in Chains fan. Well, Dave would do like five amps a side. He would just like chop it all up and he'd have like different amps and then he'd just EQ them in different ways and then blend them all together. You think of that, um, gun, junk. I mean, just it's interesting because like when you listen to it now, you think, oh, it's not that big of a guitar sound compared with the way, you know, death metal, you know, like modern metal's gone. But if you listen to it through a PA or through some huge speakers and just crank it, it's the biggest guitar sound you've ever heard. It's just just the way he completely controlled it, like obsessionally, yeah. the way he EQ'd that. Yeah, I love I love those techniques because it's very similar to some like modern in the box production techniques of like multi band uh, layering, basically. Right. Yeah. You know? And I think the way you get that huge sound is like you know the lower frequencies are nice and round and full of dynamics, and then the harmonics are nice and crunchy and squashed. So it creates that contrast. Yeah, I think Dave was a genius for that. I mean, he his thing is on an SSL is to boost and cut in the same place. So he'll like he'll take a, you know these little chunks of guitar sounds and boost the top and the bottom of each of them, and then cut right up to the same thing. So you get kind of an EQ that sort of does this. Mm -hmm. It's like it's got like little spiky areas, um, like and then you slot it together, and it's just absolutely massive guitar sound. Yeah, like the way I would. Uh, process just like a in-the-box bass sound it would be very similar. I would right. like have one type of distortion for the lower frequencies, another type of distortion for the mids, and then another for the highs, and sort of slot them all together using 
different bands. What, what about some favorite plugins? Is there any go-to stuff that you're really excited by? Well, for synth stuff, it's, I pretty yep. much use Phase Plant exclusively, which is a synth by Kilo Hearts. I definitely recommend checking it out because it's, it's got so many capabilities. You can do FM synthesis, AM synthesis, subtractive and additive. You can really do anything in it. And it's semi-modular, so you can have as many oscillators as you want. I think up to a, like 100 oscillators. And then it's got its own inbuilt uh, modular effects that you can add as many as you want, and also modulators. It's yeah, it's, I'd say it's probably the most powerful synth on the market right now. And the whole Kilo Hearts bundle, actually, and I'm not endorsed by them or anything. I, I'm right. just a huge lover of all their plugins. I mean, I've just been using a lot of UAD stuff on everything. I haven't done any A/B tests on against real hardware, but to me, it sounds a lot better than a plugin. That's all I care about. Like, uh, for instance, the A800 Studer tape plugin. To me, it, it does add a bit of liveliness. I don't know how to describe it, um, but that's definitely what a plugin that I use. Interface. What's your interface? What are you using? UAD I, as well? I have a UAD and a Focusrite going into uh, digi face, RME dig digi face with the eight ads. And so I have a sort of modular interface <laughs> set up as well. How many inputs do we have a recording at once? I mean, I'm looking behind you and I see a lot of mic stands. <laughs> I see a good, like 10, well, so the eight, 10. This is the thing. I, is that you buy a drum kit and then you're like, okay, well, <laughs> 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 well I bought a drum kit, so now I got to mic it. And then, yeah, yeah, all of a sudden you're, you know, racking up like five, Grand and like pre's and mics and stands at least. Ah. <laughs> so that's have you started I, recording the drums? Then? Yeah, exactly. That's why I have all these pre's and stuff. I think it's the best way to learn how to produce out of the box, really, to get a drum kit and learn how to mic it, because I think it's the most complicated thing to record. I definitely think it's the most rewarding thing. There's something about drums I absolutely love. It is very, very exciting to get a great drum kit sound. Absolutely. And for you, it must be really cool because now you've got your own source of your own library of sounds that you can create yourself. Exactly. Like I would do that already in the box with things like um, Superior Drummer. But being able to actually record my own drums and make my own breaks, so to speak, um, is great. And But yeah, learning how to re record a drum kit in phase with everything sounding coherent nice. and together is a really good way to learn. Are you playing drums yourself or are you bring a drummer in? Uh, I bring a drummer in, but I, I do like loops and stuff, but I wouldn't play drums on a track. Well, Matt, I really appreciate all your time. This has been a lot of fun. I, I can't wait for this, uh, you know, what, what we're going through to die down so I can come out and check over your studio. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to have you over. Everybody, if you have some comments and questions below for Matt, please leave them below. I'd really, really appreciate it. And have a marvelous time recording and mixing. Thank you once again, Matt. Look forward to seeing you in person as soon as we possibly can. <laughs> <laughs>